Hello, everyone, and welcome to this uh, market update. And we're talking with Stephen Flood of CEO of Goldcore. And this is part of our financial university education series. We, we want people to be financially and economically educated. And I know that there's um, this is an area that a lot of people feel a little behind the eight ball on, but they shouldn't because who, who taught you, right? Was it your mom and dad? Was it school? Often the answer is nobody taught. We're just supposed to know this stuff. So We'll do whatever we can to make sure that you understand how these things work. We'll take the time to explain this, use a minimum of jargon, um, because everybody should understand this because, of course, this, I think more people are going to be impacted economically, financially over the coming years than by any other thing we've seen by an order of magnitude. So with that intro, Stephen, welcome back. Great to have you back here. It's great to be here, Chris. Thanks for having me on. So um, let's start here. What, what's top of mind for you as you scan the world right now? What do people need to know about? Well, it's um, you could write this stuff. You know, if you if you kind of stand and look around economically, three hundred and sixty degrees. Um, you know, you could, you could pick a number of different super trends that are happening, and they seem mm -hmm. to be happening all at once. And I, and I kind of I analyze myself, and is it, I think is it my own biases here? Am I like a, an older guy who's just a bit more risk adverse and I see things and and then I kind of look at the data and I test it with friends and I test it with clients and colleagues and, you know, I mean, the world looks a little, you know, more unstable every day uh, economically. And <clears throat> I think what you're seeing is these super trends, you know, I was kind of thinking in advance of our meeting today, you know, what will be the five top super trends to keep an eye on over the next 18 months? And um, the, the, the in, in fifth place, uh, we kind of we get we come up with like monetary destruction, and, and what does that mean? But basically, mm -hmm. uh, the the you know the age old solution to every government's problem to print money uh, is now being used and has been used for the last ten twelve years um, uh, to such an extent now it's just been you know rolled out at at, at 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 every opportunity, and you know they have different names for it: quantitative easing, printing money. Um, you know, um, monetization, whatever. But essentially, what it means is is that your money is being stolen as as investors, as as people who own companies have savings. Um, you know, you've earned, you paid your taxes, you have this in reserve, and you're supposed to have a unit of measure uh, as a, 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 um, a, a safe uh, item for storage that you can store your economic. Uh, good work in, so you could use it elsewhere uh, uh, in in a monetary system. And what's happening is they're printing it, and um, and and to the extent that you know the the Bank of England last week just you know, and I think it was probably on page two of the Financial Times, just kind of said like you know what we need another 150 billion from the Treasury uh, to 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 pay for the losses on our books uh, from these monetary experiments. And yes, we know we only estimated a, a few billion, but it's an awful lot more. It's coming in at 150 billion. Um, which right. is which is astonishing, uh, and and if you think about it, like the entire UK economy, I believe, and I could be wrong here, they only take in something like seventy billion a month uh, in tax revenue, and they just got a bill for one hundred and fifty billion. I mean, can you imagine if your mortgage suddenly just jumped and you had to give up two months of your of all of your income to pay for it? Um, and I, and the bond yields didn't even move um, in to any great degree. I mean, in any other decade. This would be a huge monetary story. The point is, is that monetary destruction is happening all around us. Uh, we are being debased. Our savings are being stolen, and yet it's well, not it, creating it's the kind of. Yeah, sorry. Let, let me. I want to. I want to cover up on one of these things, though, because when yeah. you say, like, you know, there's 150 billion of losses sitting there on the central bank's books. Yeah. Well, this is accounting identity. So, where did somebody has 150 billion gains on their books? Don't they? Well, I, su I suppose the, the bonds that they purchased uh, have been revalued with interest rates rising. So yields go up, the prices of those bonds are going down. So the, 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 the institutions that sold the bonds to the central bank aren't nursing the losses that they would ordinarily mm -hmm. have. Um, 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 and so the central bank is now, is now holding that risk. Um, and, well, to and me, I so this is a great point, great point, because to me, this is the whole, this is exactly what we've been talking about all along at, at Peak Prosperity is this idea that the central bank set the conditions for artificially low interest rates, right, which made the yeah. bond prices artificially high. And then right before they're ready to go on this rate hike campaign, which is going to reduce the value of those bonds, they went out and bought them. So this is privatizing gains and socializing losses, because now they're saying, uh, who's on the hook for the $150 billion in losses, right? It's got to be. 
well, it's the it's the country, it's the taxpayers, it's Joe right? Public. Joe Public, exactly. Joe Public, yeah. yeah. All right, yeah, carry I'm, on. Sorry, I'm, it just always catches know, me when I when it's put that way. Yeah, but also those bonds are also sitting on banks' balance sheets, and and hence you have the banking crises, which mm -hmm. again you had during the week a story where you had like, I think I think uh, you had two banks that were were rescued again, uh, and the financial press then posited that this was a great success because this rescue happened within the private markets. It didn't require mm -hmm. a government bailout. Ergo, everything is great now. Uh, we're all fine. And you, you, you know, it's ignoring the fact that the losses came about from these banks holding low risk or supposedly low risk assets that had to be repriced down mark to market, creating huge losses, wiping out their equity, and then causing you know two large banks to come together. Um, and uh, and and again, you know, these these are this this is the the financial system, uh, in, in, you know, um, contracting as a result of these monetary experiments. So the, there's a there's a, it's it's it can be quite complicated and difficult to track. But there's one thing I'd love you your 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 listeners uh, to remember, and it's something that always comes back to me. It's it's the rule of seventy two, um, which is which is an old financial kind of test. And basically, what it means is take the inflation rate and divide it into the number seventy two, and that's the amount of years that you your your that'll take for your money to have in value. So an interest rate of ten percent divided into seventy two. Uh, um, or or seven percent into into seventy two is 10, 10 years. So in ten years, your hundred thousand in savings will buy you exactly half of what it would have bought you before, and so that's the rate that is, of theft. That's astonishing. Yeah. 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 So, so the rate so of the, theft. The rate of theft is is you could use a rule of seventy two, and that is what's happening. Like these are this is you know in, you know in, in very very uh, short order. And if you if you don't if you if you look at like shadow stats and and you know John Williams, uh, and you look at the real mm -hmm, inflation mm -hmm. rate. It's usually markedly above what you're seeing publicized, um, and and so that rule of seventy two is even more alarming. Your your money is being is being removed from your wallet at a, at a at a even faster pace than you even feel it. So um, well, that's a really good I've, way of looking I've, at monetary destruction. I love that idea, and and I'll just give people an example here in the U.S. So um, our own BLS, and you can decide what that is actually an acronym for. They're they're um, when they do their CPI. They've told me that medical inflation has averaged 3.8% per year over the last five years, and my medical insurance has gone up. The lowest year was 14%. The highest year was 26%. So using your rule of 72, my health insurance is doubling every five or six years. But they're telling me years. my medical costs yeah. are doubling every 20 to 30 years, right? It's yeah. such a gap. It's just, yeah, it's it just doesn't work out. Yeah, yeah, it's complete nonsense. And and actually, in health inf uh, health insurance premiums are a really, really good way of understanding the the overall inflation rate because um, it's something about that industry. It, you know, they, they they price in much faster than other in other industries do, and they they can't mm -hmm. do shrinkflation and they can't you know hide. Ultimately, uh, you know, it's the rubber hitting the road. You need to pay this amount of premium for that that industry to make a profit and cover its its liabilities. So it's actually it's a very good proxy. Yeah, I, I would I would toss auto insurance in there as well, um, unless accidents have spiked for some reason, which is a possibility. Otherwise, it's just cars cost forty, fifty, sixty, seventy thousand now, and fender benders sometimes cost twenty five thousand dollars to fix, you know, because of bumpers yeah. and integrated and electric cars and all that stuff. So anyway, costs. I think that the cost of to the extent they're not gaming the system, which they do, they're humans, right, um, and are trying to you know <laughs> make sure they're earning their fair share no matter what. But but beyond that, I think it is a good proxy, right? It's it's reasonably it's directionally correct. So when we look yeah. at auto, home, and health insurance, all of these are up high. What I consider to be high double digits this year, like really yeah. strong. Yeah. yeah, the next one I had on my list was um, demographic decay, um, and mm -hmm. what what that means is, you know, if you look and, and you're 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 a statistician uh, in, in all but name, but uh, if if you look at a bell shaped curve of the distribution of of ages, male, female, mm -hmm. you know, in many parts of the world, you tend to see a nice a nice a nice bell shape where the older people are at the top and the younger people are at the bottom. And what we have now is this kind of bulging of the bell shaped curve in a lot of markets. And this younger, this this uh, you know baby boomer, whatever you want to call them, Gen X, they're moving up the the the, the bell shaped curve. And what's happening is, is that people uh, we're not we're not producing enough young children uh, and having babies, and so what we we call this the replacement rate. 
And uh, it's it's quite alarming what's happening in a lot of Western economies where the replacement rate, that is the number of children per female, has reduced. Um, now, if you look at the statistics worldwide back in the 1950s, it was about just under five children per female, which is an extraordinary amount. And in the G7, mm -hmm. which is, you know, obviously where we live back in the 1950s, it was about 2.4. So there's like a, 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 a slow improve, um, addition to the population. But now it's dropped down to about 1.6. And in some, some countries, it's down as low as 1.3. And in Italy in particular, it's actually really, really bad. So what, that, what does that mean? Well, a lot of the people living today producing and, and earning uh, won't have as many people in, in their societies to help support them in their older age. Then there's not going to be enough people to you know, uh, clean the streets, run the banks, run hospitals, be doctors. Um, and this is this is a, a, a very, very serious problem. And and I wonder what happens if the current cohort of, you know, child bearing aged women decide to forego having children and decide, you know, for economic reasons and whatever, whatever reasons they have, that they don't want to have children. What happens to 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 the generation of 40, 50s and six in their 60s as they become older? Um, who, who's there? Who's going to 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 assist them in their older age? Um, and what does that do to our economies? You know, does it become deflationary? What happens to our assets? What happens to our finances? Um, so I do think that there's a, a significant economic problem uh, that's building in the system right now. Uh, the answer is obviously to bring in more uh, migrants. Uh, into the system and to um, you know to onboard them into whatever systems we have and um, and and to to take up the slack. But what's what's happening there is in these uh, developing countries, their populations are crashing as well. The growth of population is actually falling uh, very very fast, um, and because they're beginning to you know become more middle class and less lower class, um, and they don't want to have as many children uh, uh, in their households as well. So uh, it's a worldwide problem. Um, I'm not sure where it goes, but I do think it creates economic dislocations uh, and something to watch. It's kind of a super trend. Yeah, and and I I, I gave a, a little face because I, I distinguish between I think immigration is is a is a good thing, right? And um, but immigration is a policy, and it and you have an understanding of who you're trying to bring in, um, and you have some sort of a process for that. Whereas refugees, whole different process. That's just you're taking people who, by my crude estimation, when I look at these things, I see boatloads of men, mostly of a certain age, right? And they probably have a fairly random, but no, probably not random, probably a lower level of skill sets than average, I would think. You're probably getting people who need to economically migrate from an area potentially, right? So it, it's not, it's, yeah, the, the replacement I think has been done to the extent it's been relying on refugees in Europe in particular, very haphazard. Um, and, and not really well thought through. And of course, there's a cultural adoption rate that you can only, there's only so fast a culture can absorb people before there's other dislocations and disruptions that you have to then manage. And so very complicated situation, but um, yeah, I think it's been managed poorly. That, that's my assessment so far. Well, I think you're being kind saying it's been managed. It's not been managed at all. Um, I think it's been just, it's just happening. You know, and, and I think you know, um, immigration is fine, but you have to have integration. And you have to have a policy of integration in terms of how do you actually make the make the best lives for these people who are coming to to our countries, and how do you do so in a way that's sensitive to the local population too, um, and that you know that's you know language, you know, and I'm not saying it's it's indicative, but you know if you look at France and and the recent uh, riots that were happening there, a lot of the time they were um, they were people from get ghettos who uh, and youth who did not have uh, much structure in their lives, did not have much opportunity, have been excluded from, you know, French life and French opportunities, ec the economic um, um, opportunities uh, available. And, uh, and, and that, that, that's a sad indictment of, 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 uh, uh, of governments who are seen to be inept. Uh, and I don't think it's just a French situation. I think you're, you'll find that in, in Britain as well. They seem to be completely lost when it comes to this matter. We do need more uh, immigration, um, but we needs to be done in a proper and a sensitive manner and, and based on skills and based on education and, and, not, and even upskilling people who arrive on our shores as well. So, um, but I, again, if it, ultimately that might just be putting off the problem, if it's a global phenomena and we become much older in the next 30 or 40 years, um, what does it look like? I mean, are we gonna have robotics, yep. you know, robots doing all our, doing our, our bidding or, or, or what? I don't know what the answer is, 
but I do think it's going to it's going to it's going to create economic problems. Well, it will, and we already have. Um, I I was shocked by it, and I was surprised that nobody else seemed shocked by it. Um, but the General Accounting Office came out in December of twenty two with a report that said, "Hey, the United States Social Security Trust Fund, which isn't a trust fund, it's a group of IOUs." From the treasury it's one branch of the government telling the other branch that it owes it money and counting mm -hmm. it as an asset on one side of the books it just doesn't make sense right it's me putting a million dollar check from my left pocket into my right pocket it's it's nonsense but at any rate um uh they have they came out with this report and they said oh the whole trust fund even such as it is is completely gone by 2033 which is as far as i'm concerned tomorrow in this story right and that's astonishing, and that's at least in part driven by this dynamic you're talking about. We have 10,000 baby boomers a day going into retirement, so they're drawing from the system, not adding to it, and there's relatively fewer people adding to it. And then there's other complexities. The Federal Reserve totally screwed a generation, right? Ran interest rates down so they couldn't form households. They have so much money going into paying for cars, student loans, housing when they can afford it that they can't start businesses. Um, so at any rate, there's a whole lot of factors coming in here. And I'm just wondering if this isn't just sort of late stage monetary shenanigans, your number, the first thing you started with, I, I think we just, I think our interventionist central banks set up a condition which distorted things to the point where number two on your list was inflation, right? So monetization, inflation, all of these things are systemic issues to me, Stephen, where it's impossible to plan now. Right. I'm how do you totally how do you plan for a household? What, what what plans should I make for my business next year? I'm in real estate, let's say. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I mm -hmm. have to guess what the interest rates are going to be. Otherwise, I can't make a move. And and so it's all the, the planning's been destroyed, I think. Yeah, I mean the government is a bigger and bigger part of our economies. Um, they are um without fiscal constraints, that means that they can spend without any kind of consequence. You know, so they can, you know, the Treasury of the UK can run up a hundred and fifty billion bill. And the market doesn't blink an eye. Um, why is that? Well, that's because basically they are the bond market. We don't have any way right. of punishing bad policymakers. Um, and and in the past, if you ran up a bill that was unexpected, your 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 bonds would crash. You become a you become a credit risk. Your yields would go up. Uh, your budget arithmetic would have to be redone. And your finance minister or your secretary for the treasury would be fired. Um, because they 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 would have they would have um, they should have seen this coming and should have planned around it. So, yeah. but none of those things happen anymore. I mean, you have lawyers masquerading as central bankers, um, um, and and just you know sweet talking the markets and telling them what they want to hear. And it's just this unholy alliance, um, you know, um, d defined by printed money, which which obscures everything. So we need to be able to uh, assign resources. Um, uh, you know, using our market market mechanisms, uh, and we're being denied that. So we're living in 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 a world with huge huge risks uh, building at, at every level. Uh, you know, from a from a demographic level, uh, monetary level, an environmental level, geopolitically, um, and and we don't have the toolkit available for us to uh, assign resources capital uh, uh, effectively anymore. And that's why you're like, seeing this, like, you know, you're actually starting a business, like, what does the next 18 months hold? Give me some sort of um, some sort of uh, comfort in that so I can actually take a risk. Yeah, you're, you'd be mad to because you just don't know, you know? Yeah, so it's that feedback loop, right? So so to me, the Fed at all, all the central banks, they should never have been in the business of trying to control the price of money, right? Yeah. Um, the price yeah. of money is this thing that has to happen out there in the world of risk with a real feedback loop coming back from the real world back into the information system, which would be the price of the money, right? Um, riskier things should cost a lot more money. I'm old enough to remember when when tr junk bonds were yielding in the fours. They had four handles, 4%, mm -hmm. right? Junk bonds. These, This is your drunk uncle who you would never lend a dollar to who just got out of prison asking for 10 grand, right? I mean, these are yeah. risky bets, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and, and so it's just, uh, anyway, so they broke that, mm. but to your other point, there, where's the feedback loop of consequences for the people who make really bad decisions? So those have been severed. The sort of the yeah. feedback in the system yeah. is now gone. And so that's why yeah, so I feel like a drift. You're writing yourself. There's no, no, the system can't write itself. Um, and that's what the, the gold standard would have done in, in, in yesteryear. Um, it's, it's, it's very interesting. I'm, I'm, I'm going to get to 
my number one risk coming up shortly, but it's very much related to what we're talking about. Well, good. So we have um, we have monetary shenanigans. Um, you got the mm -hmm. monetary conditions. You got inflation. You've got the demographics. What's number four on your list? Well, number four, number number sorry. So monetary destruction, demographic decay, and number 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 three on my list is uh, environmental destruction. Um, okay. Now. I know this is a hot button topic for a lot of people out there, and they politicize it a lot. Um, wherever you come from, um, you know our environment is changing, uh, and and the question is, what does that change look like? What is that rate of change? What are the consequences of that change? Uh, what are the economic uh, um, uh, risks from that change, and what can you do about it? Um, and I think I think uh, there's 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 a lot of kind of hyperbole and and panic and um, the media have really jumped on this bandwagon in many respects, but overall what we we are seeing is is that there is a warming of the planet, um, and we are seeing uh, you know carbon levels increase um, in in our air, um, and we are seeing you know we're burning more coal now globally than at any point in history. Even last year was the biggest coal burning year ever. Um, and and you know we need to understand is it is it human is it is it natural is it a natural cycle is it a combination of both which is where I would be I think it's it's, it's a combination and and what is our ability to absorb this change um, but if 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 you're if you if you've relied on you know um, you know certain weather patterns for a hundred thousand years uh, and they are the norm and your 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 food production is based on those kind of observable patterns and your population uh, centers are also then related to the where the food is produced and those those observable patterns and suddenly they change for whatever reason what do you do and how do you how do you create an, a kind of an anti-fragile society that can adapt to change uh quickly with the least amount of loss um it seems to me that um we are uh, in in a in a very very precarious position at the moment uh, with our with our climate, um, and we don't seem to have any joined up thinking uh, with our with regards our energy infrastructure, uh, and a lot of the 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 statements and 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 policies that are being pursued don't seem to be uh, produced um, with 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 rigor or with scientific facts or with with data or with economic r reality. Um, and we seem to be going down the wrong path. Um, so uh, there's there's talk now of 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 de de escalating the economy, um, uh, reducing reducing the amount of um, activity that we have uh, in favor of a of a more neutral climate environment. Um, but I what I do think is is that you know whether it be El Nino this year and and what does that look like the costs that we're going to, have to bear in our insurance premiums. Um, you know, do we build? Do we rebuild in Florida after a hurricane on sandbars? Um, do we put infrastructure into those things? I mean, like, I think we need to have a really roots and branch uh, evaluation of how we interact with our with our society. The UN. There was one statistic um, which really gr grabbed me, and it came from a UN report, and it said that something like, and I could be misquoting, but ninety percent of all the uh, mammals, uh, sorry, the mass of mammals in the world. Were either human or bred for human consumption. Um, mm -hmm. So we've really taken over the garden. You know, I mean, we're we're not just like one species of many. We are um, predominant uh, in our environment, and you know that can't be ignored. No, it it can't. I, this is a subject I, I touch on quite a bit um, because I care a lot, and and I care about all the life forms on this planet. It's a beautiful, wonderful thing. I love nature. I, I, I'm con constantly astonished by what evolution or God has managed to come up with. You know, an octopus is a strange, wonderful thing. So is an elephant and all this. At any rate, what we're seeing now is um, collapses in some really vital ecosystems. And I, we don't know what we're doing. So we're still humans. Hopefully AI comes along and helps us manage complex systems because we're not complex thinkers, generally speaking, but our political mm -hmm. system is totally dead linear and very ego driven and, and just not fit for purpose here. If the purpose is to figure out why we have a roughly 75% collapse in insect mass, let alone species counts, we don't even know what, what's going on there yet because it hasn't been studied. I mean, there's a few graduate students on it, but that's about it, right? So. We are, Stephen, we're busy collapsing a 480 million year old food chain. Do we have any clue what that means? We have no clue what that means, right? 
it alarms yeah. me. It alarms me like the people who are like, oh, we have a plan. We'll just spray sun blocking stuff way up there on the stratosphere. I'm like, whoa, 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 slow, slow that down. Because if you do that and it doesn't turn out like you thought, that's a 40,000 year recovery cycle as that stuff slowly drifts out. Like we're playing with, yeah. I feel like my metaphor, I call it monkeys with machine guns. We can pull the yeah. trigger. We can observe the effect. But we have no clue how to rebuild it or what's actually happening or what the consequences are. I mean, it's it's we're doing things that I worry are irreversible. And I'm old enough to remember. I saw a very different ecosystem from people who are being born today and coming into this. This is their baseline. Yeah. My baseline yeah. was very, very different. Right. That's well, how I remember. Like, I, and a lot of people have said this to me as well. And I remember as a child, like you'd go on holidays, you didn't fly anywhere, you drove. And and right. when you got to your destination, you had the bugs on your windscreen or your your windshield were just like extraordinary, <laughs> you know. And yep. you go now, and there's hardly any bugs in your windshield. Um, and and it's just just the truth for me. Uh, and and I have a and I, I may have mentioned this before to you in the previous conversation. Um, I have a very very good friend of mine who runs an organic farm in 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 Ireland where we buy most of our meat as a family, uh, our chickens mm -hmm. and our lamb and our beef. Um, yep. And it's all organic. It's beautiful. And he set the farm up about, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago. And I remember he did him. He was telling me it was a regular farm before and they used to spray it with Roundup and glycophosphates. Um, and they had a mono monoculture grass and they had large beef and they just used to trod these huge, big monster animals. Uh, and then he said when he went to organic, uh, it took him about 10 years or so to transition to organic. Uh, and then he has now he has multiple different uh, grass types and he has small cows that don't pound the ground and turn into concrete. Um, but what he did say is when they when they took over the farm, about 300 acres, they had a uh, an audit done of the insect species per acre. And there was something like 80 different species in that traditional farm per acre. Now, I could be wrong. It could be like plus or minus. Uh, but then mm -hmm. 10, 15 years later, when he when he got the survey done again, the number of species had blossomed to like 250 or 260. Um, uh, again, don't quote me, but it was an extraordinary rise in species based because they'd gotten rid of all of the chemicals that they were using. Now, the productivity of that farm in terms of total output would have been less. The quality of the of the actual output would have been much, much higher. The taste was much better. Um, mm -hmm. um, but also the fact that he had this beautiful oasis of, 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 of nature with multiple species and insects and 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 uh, all over the place, um, it was just incredible. And like uh, it is, it is the most miraculous place to go. I love going down there with my kids and learning more yeah. about what he's doing and, and his whole family. It's a, an incredible story. But it, well, it tells probably the tale one of these places of our, of our that intensive you can... agricultural practices. Oh, absolutely. And these are all things we can do. But I'll bet that that sense you get is kind of almost on a energetic level when you step into a place that's well managed and it's abundant and the natural systems are all vibing, it just yeah. feels different. You know, it's alive and wonderful. Yeah. And um, yeah, it's, it's the energy. Yes, the energy. It's hard to quantify. I'm sure if we broke it down, maybe we could, but it's, you can just feel it, right? It's like pretty obvious, um, you know, and you go to a, a mono industrial farm and it's just, it's just dead. It's just death, yeah. you know? So, yeah. and that's part of it is we can't, we can do things better. Like, like to me, whether you care about humans, we go, okay, male, human sperm counts have declined 50% in 40 years. It is just a straight line down. And we might self-interestedly say, that's not cool. So to me, the first thing you would do is you'd say, let's rewind the clock. What have we introduced in the last 40 years chemically? Because this is an environmental toxin, obviously, and it's global. So mm. we can start fingering culprits. We can say, well, what's global, you know, and also what's new? And we could start asking questions and then we could ask, can we live without that stuff? What if we just pulled that stuff off the market for a little while, you know, but that's not yeah. how we're operating right now. It's just more stuff and out it goes. And Yeah, it's, like... it's really incredible. It's incredible. I, I was looking at a video, um, Sir James Goldsmith. Um, I think that's his name, Sir James Goldsmith. He was a, a billionaire um, and he was around in the 90s. Um, and he was arguing against the adoption of GATT, the, um, the precursor of the World Trade uh, WTO, WTO agreement. And what that was doing was going to bring in a lot of developing economies, India, China, into the, the global trade agreement and remove tariffs. And, and he was arguing, he's like, oh, well, this serves the people who own companies. And it mm. serves, um, it, 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 what it does, it goes against society and it's not in society's interest. 
um, it'll take two billion of the three billion people that live on the land out of the land and into the cities. And mm. and what'll happen? And um, those people won't benefit necessarily. They'll they'll just they'll, they, what'll happen is you'll have um, uh, a loss of of uh, the environment, um, uh, intensive agriculture, um, and huge consequences economically, and the loss of jobs in the West. Um, and he said it's not necessarily about getting the most food and the most profit, but it's about serving society. And we need to think on those terms. And he argued an awful lot. He died a few years later. Um, but it's a it's it's a Charlie Rose interview. If anyone's looking to to to, to dive into it, I couldn't. I, it was the most extraordinary interview uh, back in '94, I think it was. Uh, so you should look that up. And and, and it really it really it, it, there's an awful lot of truths in it that have now come to bear. And our and our environment is suffering terribly. Our water courses are poisoned. Our insect population has been decimated, and uh, and our and our populations are you know not being served by um, intensive agriculture. And I think it's 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 been found out. You know. Yeah, and and the water temperature off of Florida just recorded triple digits the other day, um, first time in as far as I know. Uh, maybe it's done it before, but you know, hundred degree water. I don't even. So my, you know, when I had a hot tub, hundred two, hundred three, was like that was, you know, and I could I could survive in there for you know yeah. a, a nice soak, but not forever, right? And it's just yeah. it's way too hot. So these things are changing, but economically. This is going to have huge impacts, of course, because if the rains don't fall where we thought they were going to, maybe crops don't do what we thought they were going to. Sometimes it gets too hot for crops, like corn needs a certain temperature nighttime below in order for fertilization to happen. Uh, there'll be hurricanes, things like that. We'll see, um, you know, the correlation there is kind of uh, tricky, but you could imagine with 100 degree water, maybe maybe a ripper or two might come out of that cauldron. But uh, it, it feels like we're going to, these are costs that have not yet been factored into any plans that I've seen. And of course it's a concern, I think, that mm. we should we should have a little we should have a little spare in the budget, you know, a little little <laughs> little capacity for unplanned uh things like this. Yeah, I don't think we can take we can't bank anymore on a stable environment and environmentally. And and you know if the jet stream shifts, um, you know, like it's like it's doing right now in Europe where you have extraordinarily high temperatures. Uh, in Ireland, we have um, uh, you know a huge amount of of, of rain, uh, much more than normal. But we have hotter, we're at much hotter temperatures now. I think they're up like one point mm -hmm. one degrees in the last, um, yeah, I think hundred years or something like that, which is quite a lot, you know, in terms of the the, the earth. Um, and so uh, there's there's change of foot. Um, these systems are finely balanced, and and it doesn't take much to go through a Rubicon and then to have something shift. So I think that the answer is is maybe try to understand more how we're impacting, try to be more uh, res resilient and be able to uh, have um, uh, scenarios and, and plans in place to move our populations and change our 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 uh, our food sources uh, in order to to try to manage any change that comes our way. But we can't just well, sit back and hope it doesn't happen. No, I, I I get that, and and here's the thing that bothers me though is um let me just that made too much noise. Let me just turn that off. Um, is that there, we know how to do these things, right? So so let, let's just let's just take the argument to to one place. Um, to me, it's completely obvious that nuclear is a viable technology that we can control well that we should be using. And I just watched Germany sh shut down and actually physically destroy its last three operating nuclear plants. And of course, now it's burning lignite. And that makes no sense. It doesn't make any environmental sense. It doesn't make economic sense. It doesn't make grid stability sense. It doesn't make any sustainability sense. It makes no sense whatsoever. But here yeah. we are. You know, it's, it's bizarre. I, I, I cannot explain that decision. Uh, it is just, it is, it, I think it's one of the, worst policy decisions i think i've ever heard when it comes to energy um and 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 you'd expect more from the germans you know they 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 you know they're known for their pragmatism and 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 uh, logic and you know um yeah i do, i just don't understand it it's just it's just bizarre you know it is it is so so maybe we that feeds into um your, your next two bullet yeah. points here so so what are they so my number 2 and uh, I feel like I'm doing like a chart show here for music, but number yeah. two on my list uh, is, the, is the geopolitical uh, dislocations that we're seeing. Um, mm -hmm. And what does that look like? Well, you're, you're seeing uh, rivalry 
uh, geopolitically, uh, for um, global global hegemony, um, um, and to usurp the U.S. government um, in in the in the shape of China uh, and their um, their ongoing um, recalibration, let's say, of Asia and the de 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 developing world. Uh, China has been um, is, is obviously a, an incredible incredible economic success. Um, but in its own domestic situation, uh, they've only known really one 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 way economic growth. They've never really uh, had any contractions, and now currently they're experiencing contractions um, in their in their economy. They've they've used debt, leverage, um, a huge amount of export markets, and they are being um, um, I think hunted now uh, geopolitically, economically by the West. In particular, the United States, uh, with tariffs, they're being shut out of technologies. Um, they're being um, goaded on their doorstep in 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 Taiwan, and they are um, and and all of that, all those things are are bad. You know that they're not good for the world necessarily. But when you have a contracting domestic economy, and the people are now looking at their leaders and they're going, well, you know, I'm poorer this year than I was last year. Well, what are you doing? Uh, and, and you know the playbook forever and a day politically has been you know it's not me it's the guy across the street it's the immigrant or it's the the bad country over there or mm -hmm. it's the you know it's somebody else and so they try to find a bogeyman to blame and so it's probably likely that the bogeyman and the rhetoric in china will be you know it's the united states they're causing these problems and we have to uh mobilize against the us threat and if you're either with me or you're against me and um, what happens it's like flag waving you know it's it's uh, you know it's been carried out in every in every western economy forever to 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 you know to get support of course, uh, yeah. they are they're more likely to to find themselves in a uh, a conflict situation over taiwan or elsewhere or in africa or wherever else, and they're building naval bases. They're building up. They're bulking up their army, and mm -hmm. uh, their rhetoric internally is like, "We don't care. Um, um, we're going to do it our way." And uh, they're they're seeking to disengage with the U.S. because they feel threatened. Um, now, I'm not saying whether any of this is right or wrong. I'm just saying it's consequential. Um, and uh, you know, when you have Russia and you have their foreign reserves, you know, taken off them internationally, their central bank mm -hmm. reserves. You have the weaponization of the dollar. Um, um, if you're a developing country or you're or a country outside of outside the favor of the United States and Western um, uh, uh, countries, um, you will be right in thinking that you need to reduce your dependency. You need to to mm -hmm. join like-minded friends, uh, and you need to be ready to stand up to defend yourself. Um, so, it's it's when you have a multipolar world. It's an extraordinarily dangerous place. All most world wars never happened or never never planned. They 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 happened by accident in many cases. Uh, escalations happened. The generals took over. They pushed a button when they shouldn't have. You know we've dodged it a few times. You know Bay of Pigs and Cuba. Um, you know we didn't. You know in terms of you know Vietnam. You know in terms of how that started. You know it it was it escalated over time, not by design, but more by consequence. Um, and we found, you know, found that in a very, we were in a very difficult situation. So um, I, I, I worry about this multipolar world, this geopolitical dislocations that are happening, uh, and and the, the brazenness of it, and the rhetoric that's coming about, and how people will 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 vote in the next election. We're, you know, given a, a threat, a perceived threat, it's uh, very very dangerous. Yeah. And I think, yeah, that's in the next eighteen months. I think you're going to see a different world in eighteen months than you do today. I mean, it's that. It's that immediate. I agree. Um, and and there's uh, it's very obvious that China diplomatically is just cleaning the West clock at this point in time, all across Africa, Middle East um, and Asia, obviously. And, and they're very diplomatic, of course. So there was a moment of diplomacy at the time of this recording that happened just about a week ago that I'd like to get your thoughts on, because I have a scratchy record moment for me. It's Henry Kissinger, 100 years old, centurion getting on a plane, traveling halfway around the world, which I don't know what it takes to do that at that age or what would convince him to do that. He goes to China, meets with all the top level people there, state dinner, President Xi, top economic, military, et cetera. Um, what was that all about, would you think? Well, there, there, um, 
there's a fear that um, there's a fear that there's been never a time in history where uh, um, a rising superpower and an existing superpower were able to peacefully coexist. Mm -hmm. That they always came to, uh, to conflict, and you know that that conflict can be total. And with the amount of firepower, um, monet you know, free money. So you can you can you can mobilize the treasuries to, you know, to turn every factory into an arms producer. Um, with social media, you can control the masses like you could never do before. Right. Um, all of these states are perfectly positioned to leverage up in a conflict, and uh, and you've also have quite a, a a long time since the last major global conflict. So memories have been stretched. They've lost. Yep. They've forgotten what it is to keep peace, to fight for peace, and they they don't know what it means. So, I think probably someone of so he he would command a, a huge amount of respect globally, um, you know, in terms of his history and, and lineage and uh, and and his the role he's played. Uh, he's been to China many many times, uh, so he probably commands an awful lot of respect there. And maybe it's a last ditch effort to create a kind of a detente some sort of reconciliation, some sort of like we're at the brink here. Uh, mm -hmm. We predict, you know, our anal analysts predict that at this rate of change, we will be in conflict within five years. And we put that at a percentage. And what does that mean? It means this amount of deaths. Are you prepared for that? Um, yeah. And so, you know, I think that's probably what's happening there. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a an act of desperation. Yep, I, I would agree. I would agree. And I think this ties into uh, what's number one on your list here um because it all ties it, yeah number one and it's it's you know they're all huge and they're all massive super trends um yeah any one of them is, is extraordinary number one is the de-dollarization um and it's probably the least sexy one on the list but de-dollarization what does that mean for the last hundred yeah. years we've had you know you know you know a, a dollar globally that has underpinned economic growth all around the world um, and in particular within the United States, I mean, one of the most extraordinary economic um, uh, stories w w the world has ever seen. Um, and it's it's in large part, there's been a number of things. Obviously, it was underpinned by gold uh, for a long time. But the, the U.S. administration at the time, once they delinked de from the gold and at the, at the expense of the French and, and everyone else, and everyone else has got in line because, you know, you, you, you were a price taker. You weren't a price maker. The dollar was king. Um, is that they 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 um, talked the Saudis into the petrodollar, um, and 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 all oil experts around the world became dollar priced, and so uh, countries everywhere in the world who are importing any energy from anywhere had to have dollars in reserve in their treasuries, uh, uh, in their central banks in order to pay for energy imports because most countries are energy importers, and where do they hold those dollars? Well, they held them in dollar debt. And that's that's the exorbitant privilege uh, that has been talked about. And so, you know, if everybody wants your debt, then you can command the interest rate and you don't have to pay very much. And so interest rates are low for U.S. Treasuries and you become a, a you know, you run a deficit, but uh, um, you have this this ability to to finance your 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 roads and bridges and your and, and your markets in, in effect. So what's happening now is, again, based on. The decoupling of the United States um, from many economies around the world. Uh, the G7, as a percentage of global GDP, is like thirty percent. Uh, it was an awful lot higher in many years past. Uh, the, the 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 developing countries, uh, or sorry, the rest of the world was you know on the other side of that. They were like they they were like uh, you know maybe twenty percent or thirty percent of of GDP. Now they're now they're thirty percent plus. So what you're seeing is is that. Uh, the, the 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 developing countries are now surpassing the G7 in terms of uh, GDP, which means that they are more powerful. They can trade with themselves. They don't have to trade through dollars. Um, and what you're now seeing is with you know the the attack on central bank assets held by Russia, as a and, and Venezuela, um, they've broken the mold. Um, the 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 US and, and indeed the UK. Um, and what that means is that you can no longer rely on the international clearing system to hold your dollar reserves, uh, and you can't trust the dollar to hold your reserves. And so the the BRIC nations are now meeting next month 
in order to uh, come together and solidify their 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 um, agreements. Uh, and they're, they are looking to de-dollarize their economies and trade with themselves. And the Saudis have said that they are going to accept uh, other currencies in the dollar for energy. So they're breaking away from that agreement. Um, and this suits China and it suits Russia no end. Uh, and what it means for the dollar is, is that the demand for dollars is no longer as strong as it used to be. Uh, the interest rates that the dollar will need to be trading at in order to attract flows will need to be higher. And this is at a time when the amount of dollar debt that the U.S. government and the U.S. economy have has, has never been higher. Uh, it means that the, the debt servicing costs of that become extraordinary. And then the arithmetic, what, were the, what are they going to do? Well, they're probably going to print more money, and, and that's going to debase the dollar even further, creating more inflation. So it's a very serious, serious situation. And next month, the BRIC countries are coming together. There is rumors and I don't know um, how, how well-based they are, is that they are going to announce or begin the conversation around a BRIC currency. And the logic that's been touted by an awful lot of people, and I don't see a flaw in it necessarily, is that if you were going to launch a currency to cover Brazil, Russia, India, China, and, and maybe you know 20 other countries that aren't in, in the, the BRIC name, um, then you would back it by gold in in whole or in part um, as being a, a a form of money par excellence that isn't um, isn't uh, you know it doesn't have the volatility that the dollar shows, and so you would be able to uh, trust in a currency uh, that has gold as a, a huge a major component, and in doing so you reduce the risk of the other parties in that currency uh, abusing. So the old system would be everybody, uh, Bretton Woods, everybody uh, pegged to the dollar and the dollar pegged to gold. And, and they don't want to make that mistake anymore because then the dollar was depegged from gold without any, any agreement. But what they would do is they would probably all peg their currencies to a shared unit of currency, which is then pegged directly to gold or in part. And if they did that, it, you know, over time, probably people would shun it, Europe would shun it. But over over time, I think, sorry, immediately they shun it, but over time they would probably begin to, to go there because the interest rates would probably be lower, the volatility would be lower, the stability would be higher. And suddenly, if you're looking to set up that company that you talked about before in a year's time and you want to borrow money, well, hell yeah, I, I'll borrow in brick, you know, in brick, brick debt. And I know I probably feel a bit more comfortable about that because it's based on, you know, how many billions of people in the world all working away. Um, and so it's a very serious situation. Again, it's very much in the now. You know, the next 18 months, you're going to see this develop this story uh, with the BRIC nations. And I don't know what the Western press are going to, how they're going to spin it. Probably, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll be uh, serving their masters in government and say all sorts of horrible things about it. But it does make a lot of sense. And um, and we'll see, we'll see what happens. Fascinating. You know, I, I forget the name of the system, but I saw that in Africa, they're already doing cross-border settlement trades in their local currencies, specifically to get away from the dollar. And somebody told me recently, and I'm drawing a blank on who it was, but I thought it was very profound. They said, you know, when China shows up, they show up with some sort of a benefit. You get a port, a road, a bridge system, something cool. When the United States shows up, you get a lecture, you know? And, and so, uh, that that's my sense of sort of empire politics you know we show up with lectures and we we scold people and you know diplomatically i mean at that level not me um but it it's it's the sense too that there's this crazy esg sort of like it's a um it's like a morality play the united states is showing up with a moral lesson it, we don't care about what your culture is what you care about you know what works for you we're going to show up with a lecture that you should have you know, more trans people or, or more women or more, yeah. you know, whatever it is, you know, more green energy. And it won't matter if those things pencil out for you or make sense or any of that. So we'll show up with a lecture. And of course, the stick in this story is if you don't, you know, adhere to our lecture, like we can really mess you up using the dollar. And then it got weaponized fully with freezing sovereign reserves of Russia's central bank in February 20th, 2022. That, that's the starter gun in this thing, I think. Um, oh, and of course, yeah. so all mm -hmm. of that's happening. And, and the way I read it, I could be wrong, but everybody I've talked to said when China shows up, they treat you diplomatically, they treat you well, 
um, you will be listened to. They won't have a particular point of view about who you are and what you do on your own time, but they would like to conduct business, you know, and can we set that up, yeah. right? Which is a, a, a more constrained package than saying you have to buy into all this stuff, which by the way, we could change tomorrow fickly. We might have a whole new thing at the top of our social credit score slash interest priority list, you know, and we'll, we'll let you know. <laughs> that's, yeah. that's how, that's how it seems from where I sit. Yeah. I mean, like, and it's, it's, um, it's, it's very, very interesting. I think someone told me once that, that, that the, the, the play of the Chinese when they go into the, these foreign markets is they build that port, uh, they do it for free. They create a, a debt burden. It's manageable. Um, and then the, when the, when, when the local government default, which is almost ne- inevitable, um, then that then they then the heavies come in, and they they start extracting serious concessions over mining, which is always their their longer term objective. Uh, mm-hmm. That playbook is 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 root and branch the American, British, Belgium, French colonial playbook from the fifties and sixties, um, where they raped and pillaged these countries. And what worse, what they did was. They told these countries, you know, which are extraordinarily wealthy in terms of resources, you know, we'll extract your goods, um, we'll extract your resources, we'll turn them into turn them into goods in our markets where 95% of the profit is captured, uh, and we'll pay you uh, on our terms. And um, they stopped them then through these trade agreements from exporting any finished goods to these markets, thereby um, impoverishing them forever. Uh, and so they never, never really raised above uh at the very basic economic level and they had you know the, the people were were you know you know suffered as a result and they had poor government and 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 these people the, the government were paid off in many places you know i'm generalizing here but the playbook is just to take their resources and enslave those local populations and deny them access mark to markets which is not capitalism at all it's 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 kind of corporatism um and it's and it was it was done with the with the full blessing of of our governments in in the west so the Chinese yeah. are doing that in many respects. Um, the last, um, there was, you know, they're, they're the five major um, super trends, but there's one we haven't spoken about, which I'd love to mention if you don't mind, um, which is AI. Yes. And uh, you did touch yeah. on it. You touched, you touched on it earlier, um, and it's it's just such a fascinating. Um, I don't know what you call it. Like it's 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 an enormous unknown variable that's it's entering. It's a disruptor into- for sure. It's a huge disruptor for yeah yeah absolutely, uh, and and we're we're you know uh, you know us nerds are you know you know gobbling up yeah. everything we can learn about it now to try and you know understand what the pattern is, um, mm-hmm. but at at every level you know if you if you if you look at the geopolitical dislocation, there's an AI arms race, the happening right now, and and it's happening at a speed the likes of which we've never seen and the 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 you know the the impact of it could be extraordinary um you know we may not even see or have any full warning of the next conflict um war uh in terms of it'll be fought electronically and at blistering speeds and to and i and i and i don't want to think i'm talking my own book here but one of the ways you can somewhat decrease the risk of an electronic event is by having a form of money that is not electronic you know it's not bitcoin it's not um it's not a fiat digital currency um but but physical metals and and having something like that in your within reach or stored for you professionally can in some way um allow us to navigate what this is what this animal looks like and and how and how it might affect us. It may be a utopia. It may be the greatest thing ever that these decisions wouldn't be have, wouldn't have been made if we had a a robust AI infrastructure or policy you know uh, guided policy, um, and we wouldn't have found that you know us in the situation that we're in today. So I think it's a really fascinating don't, one. Don't worry, we we've got Kamala Harris on it, so we'll have that robust structure anytime now. <laughs> Bring our best. Bring our best. <laughs> Put them on that one. <laughs> God. Yeah, she didn't. She didn't do so well on the regular intelligence. So the artificial, maybe, maybe a better job. We don't know. I mean, it's just it's it's laughable at this stage. So I, I've given up on thinking that we're going to get something useful out of our out of our policy end for a while. But I do think that the the part that concerns me about AI is 
So the, the neural, the neural net models don't concern me at all. You can chase those back, you know, any decision made, there's a, there's an if then decision tree, you can, you could chase it back if you had to, but the language models are now producing things that we didn't anticipate. So they have what are called emergent behaviors. And mm -hmm. that means it's a complex system. And so I, I don't know how we would begin to, there, there's some unknowns there, right? We, we don't know how fast it's going to develop. We can't be sure that it isn't going to develop itself, right? So Again, you know, what if somebody gave, you know, just gave AI, uh, the, the language models, a big server farm and said, here are the principles of evolution, start writing code, evolve yourself, see where you can go, mm. right? We don't know where that would end up or what it might do, you know, and, and if we were writing some sort of a, you know, if I was going to write a, a fantasy sort of a sci-fi novel about this, I would have this thing achieve a, a, a logic state that said, you know, I want to preserve myself. It atomizes itself. It puts a piece of itself in every device out there. And the only way to get rid of it, if you didn't like what it was up to, you'd have to turn all the devices off, right? <laughs> or something, right? I don't know. I'm just making stuff up here, but it's evolving at a pace where I can't keep up with it. I just, probably every week, I, there's some new amazing thing that I'm finding, mostly through Twitter, where people inform me about what AI is doing now. And it's, it's like you said, it's exponentially changing pace, and I don't know what I don't know where it goes yet. Well, I, I think um, if you look at our economic model, our, our system, um, a lot of our a lot of our activities um, they're based on information. Uh, they're based on something known and getting it to where it's needed, um, mm -hmm. and expertise. And the systems are designed to deliver that expertise efficiently and economically, and and we trade services. Um, and we've 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 mechan mechanized a lot of our production facilities, our food and everything, and our 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 machinery, um, which 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 is incredible. But this is a type of technology that almost mechanizes services. You know, it 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 it, it mechanizes mm -hmm. data, whereas we were the we were the the holders of that. So you know, if you were to ask uh, a, a lawyer to write you a brief on a legal matter, the chances are by the end of this year, an AI service will do that to a higher degree at a fraction of the cost and, and have far greater success than any lawyer. And, and the rate of change in learning is, is so much greater in terms of adaptability too. So going for the go forward value is, is extraordinary. Uh, right across the entire spectrum of human activity, wherever we have services and wherever we have data, uh, you know, aggregation, uh, use, analysis, delivery, they're all up for change at a, at, a, <clears throat> at a very rapid pace. So what does society look like? What are these really smart people, these smart lawyers, smart auditors, tax, you know, architects, what are they going to be working at? Well, I think, I think, Anybody out there in a profession, I think the ones that use AI as part to enhance their services will out, will 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 soon outpace and out uh, and, and outperform anybody who doesn't. So uh, anybody in a profession uh, which relies on you know knowledge or or expertise needs to embrace whatever AI tools and functions uh, are there and and monitor it very closely and look to enhance their offerings with it. Because I think that the the level of services are going to be so much better with it than without, and hopefully I security agree. security has to be as a key. If we can get past this stage and keep our networks intact and secure from attack, um, I think that's going to be very important. If we can do that and have AI defending defending uh, systems that can stop um, you know n n bad actors from taking down our systems, hackers. Um, then I think we'll have a good chance of addressing some of the problems that we've we've been talking about to date, and evolving to a next level. Um, you know, which which would be just wonderful. You know, um, I'd probably trust uh, uh, an AI based central banker any day over the week over the the lawyers that we have masquerading today. Uh, this is who, the great hope. You know, yeah. yeah, I mean, I know I'm I... fantasizing here, but like. There's a great positive side too. Well, there, there, there is. Um, so I actually, you know, beyond the obvious disruptions, maybe to to doctors, I mean, to to lawyers and art, accountants and um, maybe screenwriters, because um, it's going to learn the formula for making a, a snappy story uh, any day now. 
um, is, uh, is doctors too, because mm -hmm. most of doctoring is a decision tree. Hey, Steven's mm -hmm. coming through my door. Does he have a temperature mm -hmm. or not? Is he, you know, ambulatory or not? Is he limping or not? Like there's just this decision tree you go down and, um, there's a lot of things to know about. And there's not a doctor in the world. If you're on three separate drugs can possibly know about all those interactions of the side effects. Mm -hmm. If you're on five or more, forget about it. It's just too, it's like, it's like a game of chess in 60. It's just too much. Right. So, yeah. but AI could handle that. Right. And, and then, you know, I would, I would turn over decision-making to AI. Cause I bet you, we press the button and it goes, all right, first thing we're going to stop growing cotton in Arizona. You know, it would make yeah. rational decisions that sort of elude us as humans with all of our politics and, and uh, you know, priors sort of weighing along for the ride, you know? Yeah. Well, ra rational evidence-based decisions. So you know, yes. if we're out there gathering evidence and gathering data and doing research and looking for causal, you know, causality and, and 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 understanding exactly what those variables are, those coefficients, you know, then those decisions will be made much more, you know, to a much higher level, a higher degree. One thing I thought was really interesting is what what we're going to see with AI in medicine and in education is customization. You know, in yes. in education, it's a one size yeah. fits all. You know, everybody is the same industrial unit. We all learn by rote and there you go. But like take a dyslexic like me, put them into an education system that's based on that. And, you know, it's 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 much more difficult. Um, you know, take paracetamol. You know, it's it's routinely um, prescribed, but not everybody should be having paracetamol based on the instructions on the back of the pack. You know, their livers function differently. So if you have um, if you are if your profile, genetic profile is understood uh, and and available for decision making, then your medicines can be customized to you. And my God, I mean that might that might be just unbelievable in the effects that will have in terms of quality of life, intelligence, um, you know, the gut biome, uh, all these amazing things um, could be un could be unpacked uh, to huge huge benefit. Yeah, yeah, and if, um, but of course it'll be used for for ill as well. <laughs> It's a technology. Well, this is why we need we, yeah. we need a Magna Carta for digital yeah, rights. Yeah. We need to have that urgently because that changed the world when it came out in whatever it was, 1088 or whatever it was. Um, right. Again, I'm probably wrong on that, but we need that for yes. the digital world. You know, we need a Magna Carta that sets out the law and, and our rights, you know. Well, have you heard about so the so-called world coin, which was actually put forward by the guy who's the CEO of chat gpt's company right um saying that we need this digital identity so that we can separate humans from non-humans and i'll tell you I'm, I'm of two minds i'm always a little suspicious when somebody has some sort of a big brothery let's track this and digital id there's there's a lot of things that have to be thought through on that front but i'm not against it because i will tell you this my experience on say twitter of over the past few years is more and more and more it's bots it before they were fairly easy to detect but now they're not just sort of like this bot everybody sees this bot I am convinced that the bots know me per more personally and I'm getting nudged, shaped, you know, there's these things happening, which actually is, is kind of like an experiment on me without my informed consent, right? It, it's, th there's a lot of danger in there and whether somebody's trying to nudge me towards a certain product or a political stance or a candidate, it's happening now and I can see it. And I've, I've decided I, without the faith, the trust that I know what I'm dealing with anymore, I'm getting dangerously close to just flicking that off and saying, I can't. I can't be in this environment because they're too good. Like yeah. well, these no, bots are yeah, I mean, really they, good. They know more about you than you know about yourself. Uh, they, they, I think, was it, um, I saw there recently that, is it, I don't know, Target or one of these big chains, they can, they can monitor you in their stores, whatever it is. They can tell when you're pregnant before you know you're pregnant, but it's just the way you uh, interact with products. Yeah. Um, Facebook needs 17 data points um, to predict you know, your decisions going forward and what you're going to look at. Um, I think they, they actually create uh, a, a, a digital twin of you uh, in order to, to, to um, allow them to predict forward your actions. No, we need to make the person sovereign uh, digitally. You know, we need to have a digital sovereign uh, legislation that very, very specifically guards against manipulation um, and takes away sovereignty. Because if you manage the information someone gets, you're denying them free choice 
uh, and and you're manipulating them for your own profit seeking exactly. purposes. And that, you know, that doesn't actually serve the corporations engaging in that behavior long term. That actually erodes the the our societies uh, and turns us into kind of, you know, these, um, you know, zombies. Um, it's 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 very, very it's interesting. I mean, like, again, if you look at it, there's, there's you know, our, our, our young people, they were saying that I was looking at this and, and, and recently and, and, and there was some commentary around it thing. Older people will look at this and disengage completely. They'll say, I don't understand it. It's too scary. I'm just going to go to ground, um, climb into mm -hmm. a cave and, you know, whatever. And they just disengage from society. Younger people will try to get ahead of it, some of them, um, but some of them will not. They'll actually, what will happen to them, they become uh, in, entrapped by it. They'll have digital AI girlfriends. Uh, they will uh, be gaming. They'll just be consuming information all the time, being you know, um, sensitized, uh, and they will not have any real power to define uh, their environment or their 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 prospects in any real way. They'll just be consuming information like zombies. Uh, and then you'll have those the, those one co the cohort will will engage with it and drive it forward. But you know, we need to to go back to Jimmy Goldsmith back in the nineties. We need to look at the bigger picture here and serve society. And we need to very quickly get our act together from a legislative, legislative point of view before the lobbyists get control of the narrative. And my God, they are trying to do that right now. Uh, these yeah. big tech do not believe a single word they say about, oh, mm. it needs to be controlled, we need to slow it down. They are just trying to go do a land grab. They're on their horses. They've got their flag. They're you know, they're riding across Wyoming right now and they're trying to grab as much land as they possibly can. Um, no, this is a, a, an existential threat to the world and we need to define and make the person sovereign in every respect and have this serve society and not have society serve these masters uh, of AI. I totally agree. Totally agree. But it's, it's uh, just going to have to keep our eye on it because it is evolving fast. We, we are using it in my own company. I, this was something the minute chat gpt2 i said I, I called up my team and i said i don't think we're in the content business anymore because <laughs> you know there's so much certain levels of content are now just automatically generated but how you manage that is is still important and by the way um you know for people going to ground i mean it's, it's part of the service we offer at peak prosperity is is that when you come behind our paywall the real people there right and that has a value all on its own so on one respect this this artificial, I can't trust anybody out there in social media space anymore because I don't know that if they're even real or how I'm being nudged. There's a currency value now to, to being with, with people you can trust because we all have to sort this out, right? And we want to sort it out on our own terms and how you interpret all of this data we've just been talking about from your position in life, the country you live in, the company you run, all of that, it might be different from mine and that's fine. But we need real people you know, parsing through the data as best we can um, without a, without, you know, those, those AI motives under there, you know? <laughs> yeah, I agree, I agree completely. Yeah. We're moving from yeah. big data to, and we need to get into big communities. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I think that's the trend going forward. That That's where I've actually yeah. staked a lot of, um, my company's direction is that, you know, once upon a time it was information. So I created the crash course. Now I believe in, I want people to connect. And to the extent we have an internet, we can connect that way so we can find people we're simpatico with across miles. But ultimately, it's about how are we going to reconnect with our, our communities where we live, you know, and, and that's the that's the big challenge. <clears throat> and that's what's under attack, you know, with these refugees and with the declining population and with the monetary shenanigans and all of these things. It just it feels like it's fragmenting us. And I think we need to go the other direction. We're going to need to pull together more more mm -hmm. tightly to get through these next sets of years. Yeah, no, it, it's um, it's the prize is there to, for the for the taking. Um, we have extraordinary opportunities ahead of us, and um, but it, you are gonna have to work for it, and we're gonna have to collaborate. And I think you're right. We said about communities, in, and we, I think you call tribes, you know, and and you you've got a, a tribe there uh, on Peak Prosperity, which is superb. Um, you know, we were looking at your your portal today, and and admiring how well it was produced, and and the 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 comment section, and how you know active it is you know we have a lot of really good you know good people there and, and it's, it, the work you do is just tremendous you know i know oh, it's, you know in some ways it's a job but it's also a vocation it's obviously a vocation yeah. 
and yeah. uh, and it's I think um, it's great. Yeah, no, I, I just um, I think I think uh, if if you're if you're watching this and you don't have a peak prosperity account and and uh, I'm not getting paid for this, but you should definitely um, you definitely sign up because I think uh, it's really about getting more signal uh, and less noise. And 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 having a respectful place where you can collaborate and and ask good que- ask questions and get and get good answers and that's the only way we're going to really as a tribe navigate the future you know. Wow, uh, thank you for that. That was very well said, <clears throat> and I should pay you for that. It was it was so well done. But um, <laughs> so yeah, I mean, as we close out here, me, but... <laughs> <I'm joking. laughs> no, but thank you for that. Very authentic. I appreciate that a lot. Um, and and as we close out here, I do want to talk now about. Um, gold and silver. By the way, full disclosure for anybody watching, I am irresponsibly long gold and silver, and I have been for a long time. Um, And I intend to stay that way. And the reason for that, I could show you chart after chart of monetary debasement. And my study of human history suggests that people always want the free lunch. And so um, I don't judge that we have anybody sort of Paul Volcker-esque on the landscape who's got the, the gravitas and the backbone to do anything other than what we've seen for the past 30 years, which is print, get in trouble, print more, get in larger trouble, print even more, get in huger trouble, print even more. I think we're just in the next, and probably close to one of the last gyrations of that particular, you know, ever increasing amplitude, you know, thing. So that's where gold and silver come in. And and that's why I I love gold core. I love working with you guys. I love the the comments we get back from people about how well they're treated because customer service is everything to me, but as well, the actual structure of your service. Awesome. Really good stuff. So you're very kind. Uh, Yeah. I mean, we, we have a 4.9 out of five rating with our clients and we started collecting them in 2012. So, you know, um, you know, it's, 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 and we have, you know, that's, that's extraordinary. It's not me. It's the team. They're amazing. Uh, they're not paid a commission to sell gold. It's it's really about winning a customer through service and execution and making sure we do exactly what we say we're going to do. Um, we don't. We don't. Um, we don't. A lot, there's a, there's, there are some some operators out there who will you know bait and switch and 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 switch you into high premium products and. You have to be really, really careful who you deal with. You know, typically my, my golden rule is if they're advertising on TV, you should not be calling them um, uh, because they, they're probably not a, a you know, they're not running their, their, their business as well as they should be. Um, so it's, uh, you know, we're, 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 we're really proud of our record. We're 20 years in business this year. Um, and we, we basically, I suppose we specialize in, in storing metals safely around the mm-hmm. world uh, on a segregated allocated basis. So, you know, your mm-hmm. metal goes on the shelf in a box next to my metal, which is in a different box, and they don't mix. And if you want yours moved or sold, it's yours. Yeah. It doesn't say it on our balance sheet. It's not on anyone's balance sheet except the client's balance sheet, you know. Yep. That's what we do. Segregated, it's yeah, it's a big deal. Um, so, you know, making sure everything's insured, all this and that. And and as well, um, I mean, obviously, I, I, I believe everybody needs to have some physical gold and silver in their hot little hands. That's, you know, that's your insurance policy. But beyond that, it becomes a, a, a either a maintenance or a security risk to have more. And having it securely yeah. vaulted and stored is is a, a good solution to that. And then, of course, now given the geopolitics, I don't know what's going to happen anymore. Um, you yeah. know, so, so Evie, my partner and I, we have these every so often, like it sort of comes into the conversation like, do we even know which country we're going to be in in 10 years? We, we don't know, right? So there's, um, yeah, geo, we, you need the true diversification. You know, the the, the jurisdictional um, jur- sort of thing is, is yeah, uh, yeah. it's actually on our minds these days, as much as hard as it is to say that. I had, I had a client on the phone, just as you're speaking there, in terms of the variability about your circumstances. You know, you just don't know. Um, and... I had a client the other day on the phone and he sent me a text message and he said, um, I, I think like five clients have my mobile, <laughs> by the way, he got it somehow. But anyway, mm-hmm. um, so he sent me a message and he said, I urgently need to raise money. Uh, so I called him up, you know, 10 minutes later and he had a tax bill that came out of the blue and he had to pay it. That day he had to send in a check. I don't know what he was doing, whatever, you know, it happens. So he had to sell. Um, we he had uh, we sold two one thousand ounce bars in Zurich, um, and we had the money in his account within 
uh, I think it was an hour and 25 minutes um, for those oh. bars. So they were liquidated. Mm -hmm. uh, they were on the shelf, liquidated. Uh, and the money was in his account in about an hour and 25 minutes. And then he had collected his bank draft and was on his way to make payment on that tax bill, which I would have had consequences for him. Um, but, you know, it was it was a great example because it doesn't typically happen that fast, by the way. I'm not saying everything happens that fast, but where you can mobilize an asset that is real money um, that it can't be printed, that's sitting in a vault in Switzerland in, in a non-bank institution, uh, segregated with a serial bar number on it. It was the same bars he bought, you know, 10 years previously and uh, liquidate them and have a, you know, cash in his account to meet a liability uh, was extraordinary. Um, you know, it's, there's not very many assets that you can do that with. And I suppose, you know, we're very good at what we do, but the market for metals is very, very liquid. There's a huge amount of people buying and selling uh, assets. Uh, and, and we work with all the biggest refiners in the world and mints. Um, and we're, um, we also just became... Um, uh, we just joined the LBMA, London Bullion Market Association, which is a huge coup. Uh, I remember I was speaking to you about our application like a year or so ago. Yes. And we got yeah. through and we we became the Congrats. first new cohort of dealers uh, in that in that in that uh, that that uh, association. So we're really proud of that, and uh, and um, yeah, it's great to serve our customers. Well, fantastic. So any anybody who's thinking of um, buying and storing gold, please check out Goldcore. And um, if you come through our website, we've got we've got uh, special deals for people who who come through. Um, and yeah. uh, anybody, if you just mention, you know, you heard for this through the Peak Prosperity interview, they will treat you even better than excellent, which is hard to do. <laughs> if they give us five stars, yeah, no, um, yeah, no. There's a special there's a special uh, deal there as well on the Peak Prosperity site. Um, uh, we work well with with you guys. I, I, our customer, our, we have the same exact approach to customer service, you know, and our customers, you know, um, I'd say it's a vocation in some ways, um, but they can sign up there, and and that way we can we can track it all the way back. So um, definitely do that. Well, good. Well, I know it's it's late your time because we're, we're separated by at least what five six hours. Uh, I forget daylight yeah. savings time where we're at. But uh, thank you so much for your time today, Stephen Flood, uh, CEO of Goldcore. Really appreciate your insights here today. Thank you so much, Chris. It was great to be here. Time flew, by the way. It was great. Great chat. Fantastic. All right. We'll talk next time. Uh, everybody else, come back to Peak Prosperity if you're watching this out on YouTube or some other place out there in social media. And we will carry on the conversation. Um, this will trigger a whole lot of comments, and it would be lovely to have you there commenting with all of us. Until next time, I'm Chris Martinson, and we will see you when we come back. Bye-bye.